Welcome to the Business of Government Hour TV, a video companion to our flagship radio program. I'm Michael Keegan, your host. Each week, government executives and thought leaders join me for an informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government and its effectiveness. These individuals are truly changing the way government does business. How is the U.S. federal government leveraging data as a strategic asset? And what does the future hold for the data and statistical communities within the U.S. federal government? I'll explore these questions and so much more with our very special guest, Nancy Potok, Chief Statistician within the Office of Management and Budget. Take a look and take a listen. Download the entire interview on Podcast One, iTunes, and at businessofgovernment.org. So let's start off with some history. Uh, could you give us a, an overview of the history and mission of the Office of Management and Budgets, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs? How does it work within the management and budget sides? Well, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which um, I'll call OIRA, okay. if that's okay with you, yeah, um, it was really established back in the 70s in the Paperwork Reduction Act. Um, in a lot of people forget the information side because it's most well known for regulation and deregulation mm -hmm. and reviewing government regulations. But the information side is the part that I concentrate on. Um, it It is not part of the budget or the management okay. side. It's its own office, standalone, with an administrator who is appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and reports to the director of OMB. Um, so part of the um, rationale for why the office is there is really to reduce burden on the public and to have more efficient information collections across government. Um, but efficient also means high quality. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we do in OIRA is um, we review information collections. Um, so they could be scientific studies. They could be um, studies that feed into a cost-benefit analysis that may drive a regulation. But there are also um, surveys, um, the, the surveys done by the statistical agencies, and they are um, forms that people fill out to get benefits. And the main purpose is to really make sure if it's a study that it has a scientific design, mm -hmm. um, it's rigorous, um, and objective, and unbiased. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it's a, a statistical collection, same thing, that it's high quality using sound methodology. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that does feed a lot into the regulatory process, but it has, of course, many, many other uses. That's a great uh, starting point. I, I'd like to transition to your specific role uh, and office within OMB. And uh, tell us more about the work of the Statistical and Science Policy Office and your duties as uh, chief statistician. Yeah, it's it's funny. When I tell people that I'm the chief statistician of the United States, States yep. there's this little pause. Then people say, wow, that's the coolest title I ever <laughs> heard in government. And then there's another pause, and then they say, and what do you do? Exactly. <laughs> So I don't actually do production of statistics. It's it's a policy job. And it was established as part of the Paperwork Reduction Act okay. and put into OIRA. Okay. Um, and my job is really um, three threefold. Um, first and foremost, I safeguard the integrity of federal data. I am charged with making sure that federal statistics are objective, unbiased, um, not politically influenced, mm -hmm. um, accurate, timely, and relevant. And so um, the law gives OMB the ability to put out uh, regulations and guidance, which I do, on um, standards for maintaining that. I think one that a lot of people are familiar with is um, when the federal economic indicators are released, mm -hmm. for example, there's like a one-hour waiting period before uh, policy people in government can comment on that. And only the statistical agencies themselves can put out that data, and there's an embargo on it to make sure that nobody tries to um, 
you know, manipulate the numbers before they're publicly released. And so all of those rules come out of my office. It's a statistical directive. Um, same thing with things that aren't officially economic indicators. Um, there's a procedures and processes that are set up, and we put out um, methods and standards that agencies have to follow if they're going to say this is official U.S. government statistical data. So that's a very important yes. role. Um, the second thing that I do is I coordinate the statistical agencies because we have a decentralized statistical system in the U.S. where the agencies are not one national statistical office, but they're in different departments. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, 13, and we can go into that a little bit more, but I had an interagency council on statistical policy that was also established in the Paperwork Reduction Act, and the heads of the agencies sit on that council, and I chair it, and uh, we work across government to... Um, work in, in a standardized way and collaborate and um, to talk about the policy issues that affect all the statistical agencies. Um, and then the third thing I do, also laid out in the law, is that I represent the U.S. internationally. Okay. Oh, interesting. So I am the U.S. Uh, head of the delegation to the U.N. Statistical Commission. Um, in fact, I was just in New York a week ago, all week, because the commission was meeting. I also um, represent the U.S. at the OECD uh, on the st statistical matters. And um, those are very important collaborations. And um, we're, we are fairly active in the international arena. Every country just about has a chief statistician. Um, their roles are a little bit different, but um, I know many of them, and we um, talk frequently mm -hmm. about common issues. Well, you know, given um, your role and responsibility as chief statistician of the United States, what would you say your top challenges are, and how have you sought to address those challenges? Um, the top challenges are really around information and availability of information in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, things have changed considerably in the last 10, 15 years even. And the pace of change is quite rapid. And my challenge is to make sure that the federal statistical system stays relevant in that environment, uh, which is quite important because uh, we need a meeting of data scientists and statisticians. People think of statisticians sometimes almost as green eye shade type people who are calculating <laughs> variance and standard deviations and things like that. But actually, um, statistical activity really defines um, information that is used to describe groups, even though it comes from individuals and it's business data or um, social data. And so that narrow definition of statistics has changed pretty considerably uh, because there's a lot of things that we're, we measure the trend. We want to know what's happening with larger groups. And, and if you want high-quality information, it's very important that you think about the mature system of quality measurement that the statistical community has developed over decades. Um, in, in some quarters, I think there is a view that if you have enough data, you're going to get to the right answer eventually. But um, a lot of people use big data sets that aren't complete, that have biases built into them. There's ethical issues. The statistical system is a very mature framework that's important that can be uh, put to use in that. So how do we take these traditional statistical methods that rely primarily on surveys and modernize them um, for using other types of data? It's a big challenge. But the other side of that coin is as you produce better, faster, more granular types of statistical products at lower levels of geography, so instead of a national number for retail sales, uh, you might be able to at some point put out a daily number city by city, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the more data that you put out at mm -hmm. lower levels of geography, the more you have to worry about re-identification yeah. because the key with statistical data is that you're protecting the privacy of the individual 
who's provided the data or whose data that you're using. And that's why it only describes groups and not individuals Mm -hmm. and is used for statistical purposes, not for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So protecting confidentiality is, is a big, big challenge these days because technology and computing power and the availability of open data um, really create a different environment than we had 30 years ago. Okay. So those, you know, the the intake side is a big challenge in terms of new data sources and the rapidity at which you can create products. But then the um, dissemination side of making the data available is also a big challenge. You know, another big, you know, I'm going to say it's a challenge, but switching gears when you're, when you're doing something that's government-wide. Um, you know, it could be fraught with unanticipated, unexpected surprises. So I remember when we last had you on, you were at Census, and, yes. and now you're at OMB. What has surprised you most during your uh, time at OMB? Nothing. <laughs> no surprises <laughs> There anymore. are no surprises. <laughs> Everything it could be anticipated. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and maybe I have a little advantage in that sure. regard because early in, earlier in my career, I worked at OMB okay. for seven years. So I know OMB I pretty well. Yeah, yes. Sure. That's right. So it did not surprise Nothing. me. Nothing. So, and, uh, Nancy, in the previous segment, you mentioned the uh, U.S. federal statistical system and the decentralization. Um, would you tell us more about what that means? And could you give us a sense of the principal statistical agencies, what they are? What types of data are collected by these federal agencies, and how do people, business, and government use that data? Yeah, the agencies, um, while they're all statistical agencies, are quite different in their structures and size, actually. Um, and, and except for um, census and the Bureau of Economic Analysis and BLS, which um, collect more general statistics across the whole economy and country. Many of them are very specialized um, to their departments. So other agencies besides those three would be the National Center for Education Statistics in the Department of Education, National Center for Health Statistics, which is actually in the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, Um, Energy Information Administration, um, the Statistics of Income Division, which is part of the IRS and looks at tax statistics. Um, Then NSF has their own statistical agency in there. Social Security has a unit. Um, The Bureau of Transportation Statistics is in the Department of Transportation. Um, USDA has two. One um, is the um, National Agricultural Statistical Service, and they put out a lot of crop estimates um, in, in those types of very specific data. But the Economic Research Service is also a statistical agency, mm-hmm. and they look at um, things like food security mm-hmm. and, and other types of analysis. Mm-hmm. So they have a lot of economists. Um, but their, their um, statistics that they put out are used differently, but they're very widespread in okay. use. So some are really um, informing a lot of policy within their own agencies. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, statistics of income in, in the IRS is really there to improve tax administration. But they are also kind of the entryway to if you want to work with tax data in a statistical activity, you would do that through statistics of income. Um, And then outside of government, I mean, there's all kinds of uses. Um, So if you looked at something like the American Community Survey at the Census Bureau, uh, that has enormous uh, applications beyond, um, you know, just putting out data. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, state economic development um, units use that to... Uh, lure businesses to oh, the right. state. Yep, yep. Um, it's very important because you can see sort of education levels. You can see all these demographic characteristics of the population at pretty low levels of geography. And it's comparable for the whole country. 
So it's very different than something the local chamber of commerce might put out that's mm-hmm. kind of a booster type of we're the greatest county <laughs> in the country type of thing because it's objective and you can see the same data and you know it has the same quality for the whole country if you're trying to make investment decisions. And businesses also use that then when they're thinking about how um, to locate stores. Um, so they know who their target audiences sure. are and the demographic characteristics. So, um, some you know, stores will figure out what do we need to put in the store, where do we want to locate. I mean, they use many sources of information, mm-hmm. but that's a very important one for them. Same thing with home builders. Um, they, they really use that data quite a bit. Interesting. And then um, we have interesting applications as well. So um, a company like Zillow, for example, mm-hmm. if you're looking at, um, buying a house, and you start scrolling through some of these online things, and they tell you the characteristics of neighborhoods. Yes. Much of that is federal statistical oh, information gosh. that they're um, pulling off the websites and um, putting putting into their applications, which, of course, we strongly encourage. It's great because you want easily accessible and usable information. But all of things like the the economic indicator, so monthly retail sales, construction starts, um, the crop estimates, all of that is federal statistical data. And then the official poverty rate, for example, um, measures that cover how many people have health insurance in, in the country. Uh, lots of health statistics, lots of education statistics that the federal government just puts out. And frequently people don't realize it's coming from the statistical agency because it'll be the Department of Education says Mm -hmm. or the CDC says. But it's actually the statistical agency that's producing that. That's interesting. Okay. So, you know, the system, as we said, is is decentralized. Why is that the case? But more importantly, um, what are the benefits to having it decentralized? And what are some of the challenges? Um, the, it's decentralized because of the way it grew up. Okay. So, you know, right in 1790, um, we had the first census, and that was in the Constitution. But other statistical functions came up in response to need. So some of the very earliest statistical activities were f- to help Congress set tariffs, yep. so trade information. Mm-hmm. And then um, education, before long, long before there was an education department, the federal government was collecting education statistics. So that unit in the Department of Education now is 150 years old. Um, Statistics really uh, sort of blossomed during the Depression um, when the government then wanted to really understand labor, um, unemployment, um, how that affected the economy, moving into the war economy. I think that really, that period really matured and grew the federal statistical system. But it it grew so that each agency developed a statistical capability to measure their area of expertise. Um, this is different than what we see in most of the world. Most of the world has uh, uh, something that would be like a national statistical office where a great many of those functions are combined. And um, one thing I really want to point out, because I'm a very, very strong advocate of this, um, this administration put out a proposal Mm -hmm. when the reorganization proposal came out last year um, that recommends taking the Bureau of Labor Statistics and moving it into the Department of Commerce so that it's closer with the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, I think... That's an idea that's been around for a long time. It's been difficult to execute, um, but it w- it models what we see more internationally, mm-hmm. where the broad national statistics that measure the economy and the people are together, and you have more data sharing. And in 2002, there was a law passed that actually allowed um, Census and BEA and BLS to share data. It was... Um, it's called SIPSI. It's the Confidential Information Protection and Statistical Efficiency Act. And it specifically says in there they they should be allowed to share all their data. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the data that they needed to share to be more efficient was tax data. And so you needed a companion piece in the tax legislation to be changed in order for that to actually happen. And it never happened. But if you 
if you move them together and you let them be more efficient and um, because a lot of what they're doing is related Mm -hmm. and they work together anyways, but just not very efficiently, Mm -hmm. um, I think we would be much more aligned with Mm -hmm. the rest of the world in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, The benefits of being decentralized on, on some of these other areas are that you do have a lot of subject matter expertise. So, in some countries like Canada, everything is combined into one agency. In the UK, you have sort of Office of National Statistics that is kind of the BEA census and BLS functions with the chief statistician sitting on that who does standards for the whole system, but then health, transportation, education, those are decentralized. So there's different models, Mm -hmm. but I, I do think that we would benefit, and it is administration policy right now to try to um, reorganize and combine those national statistics um, in a more efficient way. Makes sense. Um, May I ask, is there any traction to that move or are we? Well, it's still early. So the budget, yeah, the Mm -hmm. budgets just Just came out. I mean, the reorganization proposal came out a while ago, Mm -hmm. but um, I think this particular proposal was kind of lost in some of the other larger proposals. <laughs> yeah, well. They got a lot of airtime. Yes. Um, although this one is, to me, of course, it's, central it, and it, quite it, important. Quite frankly, it makes a lot of sense. What are your strategic priorities for your office? And you know, how have external trends informed and shaped your strategic direction? We touched on this a little bit, um, but I think this sort of information revolution that we are yeah. going through, yes, yeah. where people want more information faster. They're used to just Googling everything. Yes. Um, so that really um, is a strategic matter, is a very high priority to make sure that when people want that type of data, they're getting high-quality data, mm-hmm. the, the you know most accurate data that they can get because of the way that people are accessing information. And um, so that that's a challenge to the statistical agencies. Um, and the priority is really to modernize the data collection methods to be able to get data out there faster. Surveys take a long time, and they're expensive, and people um, more and more don't like to answer them. Um, it's, it's an intrusion. They don't even pick up the phone if it's a telephone survey. And, of course, going door to door is very expensive. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to collect information that way. But there's the other thing that's happened as part of this information revolution is that more data is accessible mm-hmm. in um, less traditional ways. So, uh, for example, if you want to look at monthly retail sales <clears throat> and you um, want to put it out faster than, say, six weeks after your survey to businesses of what were your retail sales. So you can start to look at things like companies that aggregate credit card records because more and more purchases are on credit cards. And so the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Economic Analysis have done a lot of research in um, – taking the aggregated credit card records. So they're de-identified because they're aggregated, Mm -hmm. but you can see sort of what was bought on a credit card in Chicago Mm -hmm. or in New York yesterday. That's how fast the data are aggregated. So you no longer have to go out to the business because you can see at the purchase end. The same thing, there's a lot of research that has gone on looking at um, sales receipts from registers for people buying in the store that captures the cash and the credit cards. Um, There was another project that went on on price data Mm -hmm. where um, some folks went out and collected billions of points of data off the Internet on prices in stores. Because right now, the way that uh, the price information is put together is shoppers actually go into the stores Mm -hmm you know, and and keep track of prices of certain, like a market basket of goods and report those prices in. But if you can go on the internet yeah. and scrape that and collect all the prices, um, you have sort of a, gr- a greater source of information yeah. and you can get it faster and cheaper. So those are the kinds of challenges. How do we get that data? Um, there's a lot of information that the government has already collected on people. So it resides in not just Social Security records, but it resides in Medicare and Medicaid 
you know, um, resides in uh, veterans' records, in housing records. So why would you spend all this money to go out in a survey and recollect the information mm -hmm. if a lot of the information that you wanted has already been collected? Um, so doing more data sharing between agencies is a big focus. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if we talk a little bit about the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Absolutely. Bill, yeah. um, that's a key element of that bill is to encourage more data sharing um, for the statistical agencies to produce this data. But it Again, you know, the big challenge, if you start collecting all of this very granular data from multiple sources, um, the other priority is to safeguard it yeah. at the at the other end and make sure that you're really protecting confidentiality and privacy. So those are two big um, strategic initiatives that are in the federal statistical system that we're working cross-agency, yeah. as well as... Um, putting input into the federal data strategy oh, yes, yes. Um, and um, implementation of the um, Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking bill is now, um, it's, it's a huge it. undertaking. Yeah. So, Nancy, you've mentioned a couple of times in our conversation that the pace of change, which is inherently, uh, you know, the the result of a lot of technical technological changes and advances. I'm wondering, what does the future hold in the federal data and statistical communities relative to this change? I think there's a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope agencies uh, move to take advantage of them. Um, some, some are technological. So, for example, uh, learning more about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and machine learning. I know a a lot of people um, get confused about that. What does that really mean? How would you really use it? But um, just thinking of a couple of examples, I think might help people think about this with more clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll just go back to a conversation I had with someone um, a couple of days ago where she was telling me, we really want to work with the federal data strategy. We like this new bill. Um, we're trying to find answers, but we are overwhelmed with data. Mm -hmm. We have so much data. We don't even know how to go through it to find what we're doing. And a lot of it is unstructured. So it's it's old and it was written down. And we're trying to answer questions, but it's all sort of um, PDF files yeah. of, of forms. Yeah, so what do we do? And to me, technology can already really help with that. Um, so you can do things like text analysis mm -hmm. that with machine learning. So it gets better and better for your purposes. You know, it's kind of intelligent in terms of directing you to where the information is and in some of this unstructured data. And I, I know it really helped. One example I can think of was um, the Census Bureau went out for some public comment about aspects of the 2020 census and got, you know, over 170,000 comments because a lot of people care about the census. Absolutely. And it was sort of like, wow, how do we sort through all of these comments? But by using some of these new programs that do text analysis, mm -hmm. you can start to bucket them. And then you can spend your time thinking about the substance instead of um, – you know some of the more clerical type functions that you that you have, and I I really see when you look at advances in technology where you you went from these more manual type mm -hmm. processes to um, more automated processes. Um, to me, this is a natural next step is for people to really start to rely on the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. Um, the only challenge with that that people really have to think about is. Um, making sure that they can maintain some degree of transparency, which is very important from a methodological standpoint, because if you have any biases built into your algorithms, mm -hmm. you need to be able to discover that. So there's there's challenges there, but to me, that's one of the really great opportunities. Um, some of these programs that will help you connect data, I've seen people working on uh, some things that um, will sort of create metadata as you're um, building your data set. So it's automatically created for you, and it makes it very searchable. So if somebody wants to know, hey, is this a data set that I can use? What's in it? Um, 
you can sort of see the table of contents immediately in a standardized way. So I think we're really moving towards relieving people of some of these very tedious kinds of tasks Mm -hmm. um, that still exist and have become overwhelming because of the amount of data that are available, as well as um, making it um, much more uniform and easy to figure out what you want to access. And, th- and there's lots of ways you can use technology to have, you know, when you look at sort of some of the private sector things, like if you go to buy a product mm-hmm. at a store, you have reviews, you have people talking about um, how they used it. You have videos of people demonstrating the the product that they put there themselves. Well, why can't you do that with data sets, right? So why don't people say, this is a great data set, but it's missing these variables? Or when I was working with this, I noticed that this was very bad quality over here. And just be able to talk to each other Mm -hmm. about that. So that requires, you know, people being able to access in an environment that has kind of a front end that lets people do that. Yeah. But we know it exists because mm-hmm. we've got it in the private sector yep. all over the place. It's how people shop now yeah. or make decisions about where to go eat dinner, yeah. right? So why can't we do that with accessing federal data? Okay. Um, so that's where I think sure. the future is, is really in that usability and mm-hmm. freeing people up to answer the big questions instead of, oh my gosh, we don't have the resources. The yeah, like to say, well, we can't clean up our data. Yeah. And it's like, well, Let's get some software that cleans it up, mm-hmm. right, yeah. so that we can start using it the way it's intended. Amazing. So, you know, what advice would you give someone who's thinking about a career in public service? You really need to understand what your own um, sort of passions are, what what you want to accomplish in your work life. If your goal is to make a lot of money, do not come into federal federal or public service. Um, but if you want to have an outsized effect on the way society runs and answer some of these big questions and really make a contribution, public service is probably a great way to do that. It's not the only way, but it's a great way. Um, And I I would also tell people, um, especially early in their careers, to put their toe in the water Mm -hmm. and try it out. Don't, Don't make a decision. When I first went into public service, um, when I got into the Presidential Management Fellow Program, I thought I was going to be really in the federal government for two years as a fellow and then figure out, you know, where I was going to go from there. And, you know, now it's many decades later and I keep coming back. Even when I leave the federal government, I keep coming back because it's it's um, exciting, actually. So I, I guess my advice to people would be try it, mm-hmm. see if it's for you, Um And don't feel limited by your first experience either. Um, You know, my first experience, I knew that I didn't want to stay with that agency in that job. But the one thing that's exciting, I think, about the federal government is the ability to move around and try different things. So I encourage people to be open-minded, experimental, um, and really find what their passion is and follow that. Be sure to join me next time on the Business of Government Hour TV for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government and its effectiveness. Until then, it's businessofgovernment.org.